Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Avoid the Most Common Mistakes in Field Calibration. I'm Katie Turner, Marketing Manager with BMEX, and I will be one of your hosts for today. I'm joined by Sarah Kinnan, um, BMEX Client Services Manager, and also Rob Briner, ISA Coordinator, um, and we will be today's host. Um, before we begin, I'd like to tell you how you can interact with us today. As you may have already noticed, this webinar does have a video component, so you will see all of our presenters' faces and the host as well. There will be two question and answer sessions, one about halfway through and one at the end. We do encourage you to ask questions. We want this to be dynamic and we want you to participate. So please enter any questions you have at any point during the webinar into the question and answer box. Just know that we will save those questions until the designated question and answer session. If we don't get to your question today, then we will have one of the presenters follow up with you. There will be also be live polls during the webinar, so please um, participate in that and answer them when they do arise. And finally, tell us what you want to see next. There will be a survey that will appear at the end of the webinar, and please fill that out so that we can get your advice on what to cover next time. We do plan on having a part two to this webinar before the end of the year. Well, we will cover more advanced um, calibration topics. So um, please put your feedback on what you'd like to see into that survey. Before I hand it over to Sarah to introduce our presenters today, I wanted to let you all know that we had an event a few weeks ago. Um, and since you're here to learn more about calibration, I thought I'd share a short video that we created from the event. It's so exciting being here at Harvard where great minds have met for hundreds of years. As a university, they maintain high standards for learning and exceptional practices, and at BMEX, that's what we aim to do as well. There were some excellent presentations uh, which got everybody thinking about their existing uh, ways of work, but more importantly, how they could improve on things for the future. I've been fortunate enough to do this uh, over the last three years and I enjoy uh, allowing others to learn from my experiences in calibration. If it's coming from a paper-based environment to an electronic environment or uh, learning about the new calibration technologies, uh, I enjoy sharing information with, with everyone that comes to the workshop. Workshops like this are great because it gives automation professionals a chance to get together learn from each other, but it also gives us a chance to learn from our customers so that we can better serve them in the future. The experience at the workshop has been great. The speakers are providing the material that I really was coming here to learn. I'm excited about being here because I can take this information and bring it back to our new employees. Oh, it's awesome. You definitely want to get your hands on this system. It's scary at first, but it does so much. It makes your life so much easier as far as calibration goes. We had the opportunity to go and visit the Harvard Power Plant, which is a very exciting tour to get to see how they're using this technology today. We're here today with a BMEX tour to tour the plant and look at what we do to supply steam and electricity to the university. We use BMEX here for a lot of our regulatory requirements when it comes to calibrations and documentation. So we can do all of our steam and condensate metering and gas and fuel metering throughout the uh, campus and the plant. One of the important elements of the BMEX culture is to be able to give back. It's really exciting for me to be able to announce that we are giving 100% of the proceeds to the Harvard Scholarship Fund. One of the main objectives they have is to help those underprivileged children, especially with financial aid. We want to say thank you to all of those who attended and also to our industry experts who presented this week. If you want to learn more about BMEX, go to our website. Until then, see you next year and happy calibrating. All right. Well, um, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. We will be announcing our 2018 event early next year. And as you saw, we donated all the proceeds to the Harvard Scholarship Fund. So not only was this an affordable opportunity to learn more about calibration, but it supported continuing education as well. Um, not to mention, you'd have the opportunity to meet calibration superstars. I mean, our experts like Roy, Ned, and Hunter, who are today's presenters. So let me hand it over to Sarah to introduce them. Thank you, Katie. 
So first off, we have Hunter Vegas. He's worked in the automation industry for over 30 years and has executed over 2,000 automation projects in nuclear, pulp and paper, and specialty chemical industries. He's a frequent contributor to several controls magazines and recently co-published his first book, 101 Tips for a Successful Automation Career with Greg McMillan. Hunter currently works for Wonderlic Malik as a project engineering manager and lives in North Carolina. Our next presenter is Ned Espy, technical director for BMEX. He's promoted calibration management with BMEX for over 20 years. Ned has developed best practices for calibration with a focus on pressure, temperature, and multivariable instruments. He's a consistent editorial contributor to leading industry publications and has received significant rec recognition within the automation industry. Today, he teaches calibration best practices and provides technical support to end users and the BMEX staff in North America. Our next uh, presenter is from the state with the highest mountains. Roy Tomolino is uh, located in Colorado State, and he has been teaching calibration management for 15 years. Uh, don't forget, Keith, troublemaker. And part of Hunter's and Ned's job is to actually keep me under control during this. Uh, apologies. Continue. Which, by Can the way, is the career. Your own, your own introduction? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So his previous roles include technical marketing engineer and worldwide trainer for Hewlett Packard, as well as application engineer with Honeywell. And today is Roy is responsible for all BMEX training activities in North America. So Ned, I believe you're going to give us the agenda for today. Welcome everybody. We're glad that you were able to join us today and, um, uh want to go through our agenda. So uh, we've got things divided. All three of us are going to speak here in two sessions. We have a Q&A session in between. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about making quality measurements. And uh, Hunter's going to talk about how to make quality connections. And then Roy's going to show us not what not to do. Uh, then we're going to, after the Q&A, we're going to talk about different applications that are challenging, get into some calibration best practices, and then uh, Roy is gonna make another demonstration for us and we'll wrap up with more questions. So uh, looking forward to the session and we're glad you all are here. So I wanna get everything, everybody on a level playing field here. Just uh, let's set the stage for the presentation. And, you know, we're talking about making measurements and and when you look at your sensors, your, your process uh, transmitters and, and things making measurements, as far as a control engineer is concerned, this is, it's nothing more than data. And uh, as a technician, as a control engineer, you want the highest quality data coming in and, and it will help you achieve, you know, these basic goals of running your facility. I mean, you want to, uh, to leverage automation and, and run things at the highest efficiency and thereby uh, making a profit, which is uh, everybody's goal. So, uh, so the point of calibration and, and making measurements uh, is that your control cannot be any better than the quality of the sensor measurement. So that's the takeaway here. And really it's our, you know, our goal today is educating people on how to, how to make these best measurements and use best practices. Oops. So, uh, so when we're talking about making measurements, we wanna use uh, good practices with our equipment. And when you're doing work, you wanna show traceability. Traceability is really your pedigree back to national standards. So you look at the logos on the right, um, in the United States, NIST is very uh, familiar, hopefully. Uh, NAVLAP is their accrediting arm. 
And I'm showing BMEX uses Phenos for our accreditation and it's, it's recognized worldwide through uh, a mutual agreement. Uh, so, so we're talking about international standards, national standards at the top of this chain. But uh, here at BMEX, we have reference standards and at BMEX, we deliver working standards. And then people are, whether it's BMEX or any other calibrator, you're using those tools to maintain your process. So one goal is to have a 10 to 1 ratio. So in our laboratory, we try to maintain uh, standards that are 10 times or ha have an extra decimal or more than our calibration equipment that we're certifying. Uh, this can be very difficult. It's, it used to be a little bit easier, but nowadays things are getting more accurate and more accurate. So. Uh, uh, in some cases, you can't do that, but that is our goal. And, and what this number is, is called, it stands for the test uncertainty ratio. So, so that's a metrology term, but we're just trying to say that our standard that we use to certify a calibrator is 10 times more accurate, whether it's pressure, temperature, electrical signals. And then finally, when you're working in the field, you want to have a four to one ratio. And this is pretty well known, established. It's, it's an old military standard and it's kind of common sense. But the idea is, is that you want a calibrator that's more accurate than the process instrument that's making a measurement. So you don't want to use a calibrator that's less accurate, certainly. And again, this may not be achievable. So just know what your limitations are with the equipment that you have and what's realistic in terms of providing a good calibration. So now we have a, a poll question. So uh, Katie, if you, if you would let the audience give us some feedback. So our question is for our audience today is, do you need to connect in series for a field milliamp measurement? So pretty, if you don't know the answer, I guess you can say maybe or other, but uh, please give us your feedback. This is your chance to, uh, to weigh in on this question. And don't worry, you won't be called out on this. It's not tied to your name or anything. We just want to know answers and what everybody thinks. Aha, uh -huh. so we got a pretty good uh, response here. So, so that is a significant amount of people saying no, 22%. Uh, and then the others probably there are cases where maybe, uh, you know, there is no right answer. So uh, let's see, uh, let's see, let's move on then keeping, uh, keeping this response in mind. So when you're out in the field as a technician, your number one concern is you don't want to cause any trips. So when you're, when you're out there messing with an instrument, you know, you need to be communicating to the control room and uh, ensuring that you're not going to cause some kind of process interruption. So as a technician, you need to understand, you know, everything that's going on out in your plant. You need to be very cautious, and uh, if something's critical to the plant to keep it running or uh, could cause a safety issue or a quality issue, obviously uh, you need to communicate to people that you're out there working on something. Um, and it really only, it's up to you to figure this stuff out. You know, there's not, there's gonna be maybe some supervisors holding your hand, but uh, when it comes time to, to get in series with an instrument, um, and, and really that's what we're saying is best practice. Uh, you are going to be breaking a connection and you need to understand the impact that that might have. You know, there are some alternatives. You could use a clamp meter where you just are uh, measuring the, the current in the loop. But, you know, keep in mind that these meters are not very accurate. I mean, so it's more of a troubleshooting tool. We're talking about calibration here. So, um, you know, that's really not an appropriate way to do it. So 
you know, our recommendation is, is that breaking the current loop and connecting the milliamp meter in series, it's the most accurate way. Uh, there are, there is a test diode circuit uh, and we just want you to understand some limitations with that. Um, but obviously those can be used and are appropriate uh, if you're understanding how, how they work. So the next slide I have I, was pretty easy for me to put together. We, uh, BMEX has a blog. I would encourage you to check it out. It's very educational. And uh, this next slide, I, I was able to just uh, hijack the information uh, to, to uh, communicate to you today. So, so when you talk about the test connection on a, on a transmitter, Normally, the current is flowing through the circuit where it says loop or power and, and uh, the milliamps is, is uh, going to the DCS. So this is how it normally works. And the reality is, is it's running through a diode and the diode will conduct DC current in one direction. But, you know, this circuit is a little more complicated, but uh, just know that diodes are not ideal. But What's cool about them is when you walk up with a meter, a calibrator or an ammeter and connect on the test terminals, the diode senses that, that there's uh, voltage across those terminals and it routes the current through the test terminals and then continues the loop. Uh, but you need to understand that if your impedance is too high on your ammeter, it could cause what, what I'll call a leak or cause it won't allow all the current to pass through the meter and you'll get an erroneous evolt, uh, result. So here's what's happening is the current gets split. The majority of it will go through the meter, but uh, the impedance is pushing it th uh, through the shortcut of the diode. Um, also, depending on how old your transmitter is, these things do degrade and they do begin to leak just on their own. So, uh, so if you've got a really old transmitter, you might wanna, you know, maybe check this out and see if you see a difference, uh, whether you get in series versus using the, the test diode terminals. So uh, if you want more information on this, I, I kind of, gave you the highlights here, you know, I do encourage you to go to the BMAX blog and there's a lot of good information there to give you a better understanding here. Just okay. one quick comment. Uh, the test diode only works if the meter resistance is low. So if you have the higher the resistance, the more current will leak through it. So that's another thing that will mess you up. Right. In fact, I meant to mention, thank you, Hunter. I meant to mention that the impedance, um, needs to be great or if it's greater than 15 ohms you're definitely going to have problems with this so you uh and and our blog does point out how you can check your meter and see what the impedance is but if you look on the specs usually there's a burden voltage or something that tells you about that all right well with that uh, i'm going to turn it over to hunter all right, so we have our first poll, our second poll question. Uh, so you're going to hook up in series with it. So the question is, do you hook up downstream or upstream of the transmitter? Um, it's kind of a two choices, but you can put other if you're just confused, I guess. But uh, one or the other, which would you pick generally? And hopefully results are coming in. Or not. Yep. There we go. Downstream, mostly. About, about two to one, looks like. All right. Well, I regret to inform you that the answer is it depends. Isn't that the, uh, the typical engineering way here? Um, <laughs> so let's talk about it. Te technically, it shouldn't matter. It should be the same upstream or downstream because the same current is going through. So I could put the meter any place in the loop, and theoretically, I should read the same reading. And that is usually true. Um, one of the reasons that you might go downstream is to avoid blowing the fuse. Uh, if let's say I get a short down here, I drop a lead when I'm hooking up my meter and I go to ground and I've got a 16th of an amp fuse or a very uh, sensitive fuse in the circuit. If I'm downstream of the transmitter, I won't, sh I won't blow the fuse because the transmitter is only gonna let 20 mils go through 
and so it's protected and, and life is good. So one reason to pick downstream would be just to avoid uh, having to go back to replace the fuse if you drop the lead. But there's a little more to it than this. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about it. What happens if there's a ground in the transmitter? Now this doesn't happen often, but it does happen. I've had situations where a transmitter has an internal leak in it, and um, in this case, let's say about 10% of it leaks out the transmitter before it gets to the analog circuit. So you've got 100% going in, but the transmitter is only sending 90% out, and 10% is going to ground at the transmitter. Uh, this is not common, but I have seen it. It's bedeviled several texts when it happened. Um, if you were downstream, then your meter would match the transmitter, which you were calibrating to, and you would think, I've got a great calibration, life is good. And if you didn't cross-check with the DCS, you wouldn't know that the DCS was reading something different. And obviously, the DCS reading is the one that matters. You really don't care that the meter is right. You want the DCS to be right. So if you've been downstream, you might not have caught the fact that you had a problem here. If you were upstream, you would, right? Because you're going to see 100% going to the transmitter, but the transmitter is going to be giving you a different number, and then you're going to start looking around trying to figure out what's up. So in this case, if the DCS reads the current going to the field, and a lot of them do, um, Amerson Delta V, several others read the outgoing signal, then, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, D3 reads the outgoing signal. But uh, it, let's say if you had one the other way, um, so now you've got a DCS, and uh, I meant this one to be Emerson Delta V, it reads the return signal. So it doesn't really care what goes out to the field, it looks at what comes back. If that's the case, then you, you put your meter on the same side as the DCS so that the two should match. And in this case, of course, downstream is going to be better anyway, just because you won't blow the fuse either. So the answer is it depends. It depends how the DCS measures the signal. Ideally, you want to be on the same side as the DCS. Um, and so it's probably worth at least understanding how your analog cards work so that you should have the same matched reading. All right, so the beloved 250 ohm resistor. This probably bedevils more people in more ways, and people don't understand when I need it and when I don't need it and why I need it. So let's just real quick go over that. So what does it do? All right, so the heart, the, re, the way it works is that the sender sends a low frequency current signal on the 4 to 20 wires to communicate. And the receiver reads the resulting low frequency voltage. So I need to convert the current to a voltage, and obviously resistance does that. Now, you can consider the 24 volt power supply effectively as a dead short as far as the heart signal is concerned. So it it, it's as though it's not there or there's a dead short through there. So the deal is I need at least 230 ohms somewhere in the loop, anywhere in the loop, to get the current to generate enough voltage for the receiver to see what the sender's sending it. So let's look at this kind of in the diagram nature. So if I've got a DCS that's got 250 ohm resistance built in, then I'm golden because... When I hook up my heart, it's communicating that frequency current. Uh, it's generating a frequency voltage. And both the transmitter and the heart communicator see it. I can just hook straight across the transmitter. I don't need a 250 ohm resistor because I already have one in the loop. And both guys see it. And life is good and everybody communicates right off the bat. So now let's take a look at what happens when I have a DCS that has less than 250 ohms. Uh, one that comes immediately to mind is D3. It's 50. Uh, there are others. It depends, PLCs and that kind of stuff. Some of them, you can have isolators in there that can reduce the current. Uh, in that case, the current communicates fine, but the receiver doesn't see it because the current isn't converted to a big enough voltage for the receiver to see it. And in this case, if I hook it up, I'm not going to get nothing because there's not enough frequency voltage for me to see so I need to do something. I need to make it better. I need to get more resistance in the network. And so usually what I do is I have a 250 ohm resistor basically across the leads of my heart transmitter. I get it in series. I, I add that resistor in there. And now I've got enough loop current, I'm enough loop resistance, and life is good. I show the heart here hooking straight across the 250 ohm resistor. I don't have to do that. I could actually hook it straight across the transmitter if I chose. Either way, it would work because I've got now got enough resistance in the loop 
for it to function. So that kind of just showing you how it all good. So basically the deal is you need 250 ohms somewhere uh, or at least 230. Um, you might get by with a little less than that, but not much. Uh, it starts to get sporadic at that point. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to Roy the Man, uh, who is, most of you don't know, but he's actually the poster child and spokesman for Five Hour Energy Drinks. Um, so, man, really? you got it, Roy. Do yeah, um, I don't think I even want to go now. I And why do you guys have to put on, Roy's going to talk about what not to do. I think I kind of resent that. So my name is down. Roy. Wait, what? Because you got it down, man. You're oh. pro. All right. Okay. Okay. So with this, and let me know if my calibrator is not showing up here, but uh, as far as what I'm doing here, Hunter just talked about our 250 ohm resistor. And what I'm about to show you is related a little bit differently. If I go into communicator mode, and go into heart the way that i'm using this right now and i'm using it with heart the resistor is actually built into the to the line inside the calibrator so i'm not having to physically put a resistor in there let me go back to the home screen under documenting calibrator what i want to show you is this i have a temperature transmitter and it's zero to 500 in four to 20 milliamps out i'm doing a five up test and my tolerance is half a percent of span so let me start off here and I'll hit start and let this go. So my first test point is, okay, I probably should have thought about this before I am doing this live in front of people from quite a few countries. So the result is not looking so good, but in a second, we're going to find out why it's not looking so good. So our midpoint is fine. We got something up with the zero and something up with the span, it looks like. So, failed. What do I do here? I'm, I'm going to save this because I know that this is not a reflection on me as a technician. This is, this is a reflection on how this thing is set up. So, there's my graph again. Here's my numbers. And in red, I can see where it actually failed. The, the failure occurred at the zero and the span. So, let me save this. I'll save it as found. Now, I'll click the secret button here in the top left and go to communicator. And so, I'm powering this up. I have a temperature transmitter hooked up to this MC6 calibrator and I'm providing loop power from the calibrator itself. So I'm firing up hmm, the uh, heart communicator. So if I go to device setup and Diag service, what I'm curious about is this, the D to A trim. This is something that I, I think that 90% of the time you don't have to go in here and, and adjust this. But the point that I'm trying to make here is If you hook up a communicator and you tell, you ask the transmitter to tell you how many milliamps it's putting out. So I'm connecting reference meter. Check this out. Setting device, field device output to four milliamps. So I'll hit check. So right now, the, the communicator is telling the transmitter to output four milliamps. It thinks it is. In reality, it's not. Communicators cannot measure the current here if we look at traditional communicators, if the device itself can't measure what it's putting out is what I'm trying to say. So it's actually putting out 3.9. Let me do this. Let me grab this number and I'll put this up here. I will tell the transmitter, you're not putting out four, you're putting out 3.9. So it will increase it by 0.1. And now it's saying, is it four milliamps? It is. So now we're setting the output to 20 milliamps. So the transmitter is outputting 20 milliamps or what it thinks is 20. It's not, it's 20.2. So let me hit this shortcut button. I'm gonna tell the transmitter, you're actually 0.2 high. And you can see on the bottom right, it's self adjusting. So let me go ahead and continue on here and say, yes, I'm waiting to get control back from the processor and the transmitter. Up on the top, this, Red lettering means that the the transmitter processor is actually running. All right, now it let me out. So we just did a D to A trim on this transmitter. We found out that it thought it was what it thought was putting out. It wasn't. It was off. So let me hit start. So we're going to perform the same exact test. I didn't touch anything on the sensor side. I only went and trued up or calibrated the output, the, the digital to analog conversion inside the transmitter. 
So as you're watching this, I'm wondering if you're surprised by what you're seeing or if this is kind of usual. We might have been able to get a little bit closer by checking the sensor itself, but I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with this. So again, here's our graph and we're doing this to a half a percent of spam tolerance. And then here are the numbers. So I didn't even bother doing the sensor. Let me save this. So I'll save this as left. And just so we can take a look at this, if I look at the test results, let me go, here's our as left. But if I show the older result, this is where we started. This was all due to the transmitter output needing to be calibrated. So I'll show the new result again, and this is how we left it. So with that, let's go to our first Q&A, Sarah. Thank you, Roy. And if you two other gentlemen will join us. All right, attendees, it's time for you to send us your questions. And you can do that by entering your question into the question section of the bottom right of your GoToMeeting um, window. Guys, we don't, currently don't have any questions. You must have answered everyone's question. So is, is there anything, what's the most common question you hear from our customers, Roy? So I'm trying to figure out what, I'm trying to show you what not to do. So now, you know what, Hunter, why don't you field that question? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about quite a few uh I, I won't ask the question about your, your banana flavored lipsticks, so, but, um, <laughs> you, know <what? laughs> you know what? So you can't take your lipstick. You can do this, your lip balm and then convert it to a screwdriver. Yeah. If anybody wants one of these, let me know. Yeah. In the, in the second half, we're actually going to talk a lot more about the specifics, uh, that tend to trip up, uh, the people when they're doing calibrations, most of the time the calibration part of it isn't the problem. Um, so, and a good tech will realize that and not be banging his head against the wall uh, to try to fix something that his calibrator will never fix. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Those are uh, probably more common. I, I think so far, I'm glad to hear that people weren't confused by the uh, 250 ohm resistor. But I will say that the, um, the issue with the uh, getting in series kind of troubled me a little bit. I mean, you saw how the transmitter thinks it's good and it's not. So it really is important to get in series with it and be sure that you get a good solid reading on that uh, and that you get kind of a, a, a backup um, and, and know what you've got. Yep. Okay, we have two questions, so we can move into that. The first is, why would you ever accept a signal that is known to be a low or high as indicated? What was the end of the question at low is high? I'll repeat it. Why would you ever accept a signal that is known to be low or high as indicated? Was that referring to the test that I just did? I believe. Or in general. The thing is, are you okay just to let it go by and say it was, call it good, maybe? So... He said, yes, it was about the test you just did. So, well, with the test that I just did, I didn't, I, I guess I wouldn't call it good, but I continued to capture the results. And boy, were they ugly, but I captured those as the as found. And then I went through and, and trimmed it, fixed it up and saved the as left. So we had a starting point that was ugly and an ending point that looked good so that we know if we save an ugly as found and the good as left, then we can have trending analysis later in the future. I guess the yeah, next question was, at what point do you call good good enough? I think is what he's saying. Oh, oh, oh. Hmm. And that's, I mean, obviously, if you have a thousand transmitters to do and you're trying to just get them within spec, then that's right. If you only have five transmitters to do and you've got all day to do it, <laughs> then you can make them flawless. Um, 
I think in this particular case, Roy was just moving by just to to for time purposes. But uh, in, in the you know that's a that could yep. be a topic on our follow up presentation. Is you know talk about how do you come up with a good test tolerance and how and you know how do you maintain it and you need to be able to uh, to change and you know if you're getting good results do you, would tightening a tolerance up enable you to get better quality or to get higher efficiency out of a boiler or whatever so um, right so we'll make a note of that Katie we'll put that in the next the next as a topic and as far as just to answer where I was going with my test, my test was set to a half a percent of span. So regardless, when I, I did a trim and I was the way I had it as left, even though it wasn't a straight line, it was within those parameters and I was satisfied with that. If I would have done an as found and it was anywhere inside of those bands, then that's a passing. There's two schools of thought here. One is that if it's anywhere within your tolerance, your passing allowed, no matter how zigzaggy that line is, it's good and you take it. The other school of thought is that you, if it's somewhere around 80% or outside of 80% of the, your tolerance, then you it passes, but you still do a trimming adjustment. Okay, so, I think this is a follow-up on that last question. What okay. if we want to do an analog trim? The sensor trim? You should do both. So Roy, yes. Roy didn't do both, but yeah, in practice, you should do both the sensor trim and the DDA trim. And just, I think I'd clarified that normally 90% of the time, I think that a, cal a, a temperature transmitter is fixed by doing the sensor trim on the input. The, yeah. And that would be the same way. Instead of choosing D to A trim, we would have done sensor trim. I forget the exact terminology that was on that page. The sensor trim is a much more common one. I mean, a D to, usually the D-Day circuits are fairly stable. And so unless it's a very older transmitter, uh, it's kind of rare for them to fall out of cal nearly as often as you lose the sensors coming in. Okay. So I would always start with a sensor, and then if you don't get it with air, then try the D-Day. So here's another follow-up. So should we look at the DA trim before we attempt to calibrate the zero or span? And I don't think so. That, I guess I just said, yeah, I, I would I would start with the sensor. Most of the time, probably 95, 98, even 99 percent of the time, you're going to get it with the sensor trim, and you're just burning a lot of extra time and effort. Um, so I would not go after the DA unless you you didn't get it with the sensor. Yeah, I agree. I would run through the sensor trim and then do an, do an as left test. And if it still needed adjustment, then I'd go look at the D to A. But it's so rare. Yeah, because when you do the as found, you're going to know you, you need to adjust the zero or the span based on the deviation from perfect. And then if you don't see that in the sensor side, then you know maybe you ought to look at the D to A to really make it perfect. Yeah. In case of in the case of DCS with the low load, 50 ohms, adding 250 ohms resistor in series for heart, will it affect the DCS signal or voltage drop? <laughs> it depends. Uh, usually not. Uh, the only and and I didn't really get into it really mostly for time, but you can. In most circuits, you can add the 250 ohms regardless, and it works fine. Because um, most trans, most DCSs don't have more than 250 ohms in their um, cards, and you might have an analog that might be good for another 250 ohms. The trouble is, every 250 ohms is about a five volt drop, and the transmitter takes 12 volts to get it to work. So, I can take two five volt drops or a total of 10 volts and still have enough to keep my transmitter working. When I get much more than that, it might not. So if you've got several indicators in the field or, you know, the, the signals looping through a couple of different devices, you get near the edge of the limits and you add another 250 and what's going to happen is it's going to communicate fine. It'll work fine. It's just that you'll never get to 20 milliamps. There's not enough voltage to push a full 20 through. 
And so it'll get to like 18 and then stop. Um, so you don't generally, I mean, if you don't have any, a lot of field indicators, you could probably get away with a 250 ohm resistor every time and it'll never matter. Uh, it won't affect the DCS reading. It's just, if you add too much resistance, you'll actually limit the total current you can push through the loop. And so you can never get to 20 milliamps. Well, if you had that a loop that was like saturated, um, don't you have enough resistance there for the heart to work? So you don't need the resistor, right? Well, that's it. And that's what I was saying. You, you had enough resistance to begin with. You didn't right. need a 250 ohm resistor and it'd have been fine. Um, but some people just have a 250 ohm resistor wired into their leads all the time, 24 seven. And every time they hook it up, they put 250 in resist, uh, in series with it. And that can bite you if you've got a really loaded loop. It's not common anymore. It used to be there was a lot of indicators in the field. Most people have gotten away from that. Um, but it, it's something to be aware of. Yeah, my experience with customers is that they don't, they, they connect without a resistor and it works most of the time. So it's... Well, yeah. And and most of the DCSs now have a 250 ohm resistor built into the card. And so exactly. it's there. You don't need it. You you don't need to have a resistor and life is good. It You run into that more often on PLCs and, and older systems that had less loop resistance on their card designs. Right. So if your communicator is not working, and that might be the first thing to try is get a resistor in the loop. Okay. Here an attendee gives an example of what they're doing and has a question at the end. We had luck putting the resistor parallel to the loop. So we attach the resistor to the positive terminal and then hook the heart communicator to the resistor and the negative ter terminal on the device. And then we can read our heart signal. Is that how it's supposed to work? As long as, as long as you got a 250 ohm resistor somewhere in that loop, life is good. And you can hook up your transmit your heart communicator however you want, and it'll work fine. Yeah, I think for that example, you know, you could move just the communicator part, you could move across the resistor. You didn't have to get on the other side of the terminal. Um, and it would work just fine. You can hook it up the way you're saying it works fine. You can hook up both sides straight across the uh, transmitter and not even, you know, get involved with the trans uh, resistor and it'll work fine. As long as the resistance is there, you're good. Can you speak about the polarity on the device and the communicator? Hard communicators don't have polarity because it's talking frequency. So you can probably flip the leads and it won't make any difference. Um, obviously the transmitter has got a polarity and you need to make that right. But uh, uh, hard is really just looking for a frequency signal and, and it, you could swap the leads back and forth and it wouldn't make any difference to it. I, I don't know why, maybe Hunter, you know why, but I know for foundation field bus and profi bus, uh, with our communicator, you, polarity is an issue. So you can, if you're having communication problems, if you, it, it might just be the modem we use. You can try reversing the connection to see if that clears a problem. That's kind of a troubleshooting step. Okay. When should I do a sensor or dig trim? What's the tolerance limit to do a trim? or adjustments? Well, that's kind of the first question we had and we were talking about when do you adjust, when do you not adjust, what's good, what's bad. Roy's example was half a percent. So somewhere at a quarter percent or maybe even a little higher, you should live with that. But, um, you know, but if your pass fail is 1% or even 2%, something much bigger, it just gives you more breathing room. But I think somewhere between halfway to two thirds or somewhere, you know, Roy said 80%, somewhere above 50% is where um, you should maybe make a trim. But if it's, 
if you're better than halfway, if your signal's at 40% of the max error that you've set, so if you're at uh, 0.2, you could trim it and make it better, yes, but if you're going out on a regular frequency, um, you're going to catch it the next time if it's drifted the full amount ag again. So in practice, I wouldn't trim till it's more than halfway out, if that makes sense. So I have one comment on that. And like I mentioned before, I think there's two main schools of thought here. My, I went to the school of, look, set your limit. And if it's within your limit, it passes. If it's outside of your limit, it fails. I have one exception to that. And that's if you're in, in pharmaceutical or something that if, if you actually have a fail and you have to file a deviation and you have a potential product recall, then I would have some guard bands inside the failure so that if it if it passed, but it was like 75% of your tolerance or outside of that, and you're getting close to having to file a deviation, then I would I would pull it back in. That was great. That, that was great, Roy. That's keep it simple. I have to. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, so this attendee, he has a, his zero drifts in reference to the transmitter and calibrating device. And he said, how do you accurately calibrate a low pressure transmitter in H2O, specifically in zero to 50 inches of water? Well, one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about some things that will make the reading drift that have nothing to do with the calibration. Um, so you need to be sure that the reason that you're drifting is in fact the transmitter and not something else. Because there are a lot of things that can make a drift that no amount of calibrating is going to fix. Um, in this case, you know, if you've got differential pressure and you're trying to get an extraordinarily low reading, sometimes it's hard to vent it well enough to do that. I mean, because there's water that it traps in there. Uh, you've got to make sure that that when you equalize that you really are equalizing it all the way down. Uh, you can run into issues with draft range transmitters where they'll hang a little bit of water up in there and depending on how they're tubed up, you can get a little bit of water in the cell and it'll have a reading even though you you think you've drained it. So, um, you know, mounting the transmitter in such a way that it's self-draining, that it won't hang up water and that kind of thing can, can eliminate errors in very low draft range transmitters. One, one trick you can do if you know there's no water or blockage like you're talking about, if you just short the high side to the low side, just take one piece of tubing and short the high to low, that is zero. There's Nobody's going to argue with that. Um, so that's that's one way. But typically you're using a T-hose and you're, you're trying to vent and have the low side vented atmosphere. So you're trying to zero it that way but if you're having issues you could try just shorting physically shorting the high side to the low side that you don't even need to measure it with a calibrator that is zero and that's pretty common like on a uh, where you're trying to measure differential pressure in, in a room a clean room and we're talking like the transmitters half an inch mine plus or minus a half an inch is four to twenty so to check it at zero, that would be a good, just short the barbed ends together. And that's a, that's a true zero. All right, that's all the time we have for the first question and answer section. So thank you guys. Please continue to send in your questions throughout the remaining part of the webinar so we can address them in the second half. And Katie, I believe we go to you now. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, before I hand it over to um, the guys to continue on with the presentation, I wanted to let you all know to save the date for the ISA Process Control and Safety Symposium and Exhibition. It will be held November 7th through the 9th at the Houston Marriott West Chase. And um, there's been a lot going on in Houston this week, and our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone affected by the flooding there. Okay, with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Hunter to continue on with the presentation. All right, so let's talk about absolute pressure transmitters. Um, 
there are a lot of things that can bite you on absolute pressure transmitters. And so really kind of the theme for what I'm going to talk about next, uh, I mentioned it earlier, is often there are times when no amount of calibration is going to fix it. Uh, you can have the fanciest, most wonderful calibrator ever. It can do everything under the sun. It can be, you know, traceable to NIST standards uh, and a fraction of a percent of error, but it won't matter because there's something else happening with the instrument that's causing you grief. And so I'm going to talk about those things, and ideally an instrument guy recognizes that and, and starts looking around and doesn't beat his head against the wall trying to calibrate a problem that isn't calibrated related. So we're going to start with the dip, uh, absolute pressure transmitter. And uh, the first thing you need to know is that you know, the vacuum, a full vacuum is, is a full vacuum uh, all over the world. And so that's pretty straightforward and that's fairly easy. Uh, it's the vented side, so zero PSIG uh, or no vacuum that drifts. Uh, it changes obviously by location. Uh, at sea level, 14.7 PSIA is considered uh, ambient. In Atlanta, it's 14.2. In Denver, it's 12 or so. So it moves there, but it also moves with the weather. So if you calibrate it flawlessly today and a cold front comes through, that reading can drift simply because vented today is not the same as vented yesterday. Um, so that's just good to know. Uh, another one, actually there's several here that we'll talk about. If your absolute pressure transmitter and seal fails occasionally, seemingly for no reason, I mean it fails to the point of having to be replaced, um, what actually can happen to you is that high vacuum and high temperature can boil the liquid in the seal and ruin it. What do you mean it boils? How, how can it boil? You know, well, it can be in process. It, it, seems, it seems odd, but the boiling point of a liquid is determined, um, I'm sorry, the boiling temperature of a liquid is determined by the vacuum. And the higher the vacuum, the lower the boiling point. And the fill fluids have the ability to handle varying amounts of vacuum and varying amounts of temperature. But uh, some, you know, if you get a very high vacuum, it doesn't take much temperature at all to ruin it. And what happens physically is that the liquid boils, it puffs up the transmitter, the, the seal, and it doesn't usually recover. And so it's just shot. And uh, this kind of people don't see this or expect it. It, it, you know, obviously if it happens all the time, well, then you start looking for it. But occasionally people don't normally run into that except during uh, an abnormal situation and they get a little more vacuum or a little more temperature than they're used to and suddenly their seal quits working. So just good to know. Uh, another one is maybe your absolute pressure transmitter responds very slowly at times. I mean, very slowly. Seems to, you, you hit it with a pressure and it just seems to take forever to read. Often that's low ambient temperature. Uh, it raises the fill fluid viscosity, it deadens the response, and it just responds slower. And a lot of these same issues reply, uh, apply to any differential pressure system with seals on it. Um, these are all kind of seal related. Another one is your absolute pressure transmitter reading seems to shift around for no reason. That can be caused, obviously we talked about uh, absolute, I mean the ambient pressure, but another reason is changing process temperature. What it does is it heats up the fill fluid, it expands, and the transmitter sees that as pressure and starts to go up and down. So the reading will actually move around with the process temperature. And so all of these are going to make your calibration seem wrong, but it isn't your calibration. It's the transmitter absolutely doing that. And um, there are ways around it and to fix it, but it, you're not going to calibrate it to fix it, or you may calibrate it today, and tomorrow it'll be back. All right. So... Um, Ned asked me specifically to talk about bubblers. Apparently that bedevils some folks, and so I'll real quickly talk about bubblers. It's a fairly common uh, way to measure level in industry. Uh, effectively, you've got a differential pressure transmitter. Uh, the low side is hooked up to the top, just so you can measure the tank pressure. The high side is hooked up to a tube that goes all the way down to the bottom of the tank, and you blow nitrogen or air out of it, and the amount of pressure it takes to move a bubble out is directly proportional to the level in the tank. You know, you take the gravity, you take the pressure, and you can figure out the height. And so that should work great. And most of the time it does work great, except when it doesn't. And you need to understand that calibration probably isn't the problem. You can calibrate it, but it's not going to make the problem go away. And the reason 
is because there's several things that can get you. And I'm going to give you an order of probability. The most common thing that people run into is a plugged pipe or a layer of sludge in the bottom of the tank. Either one of these is going to increase the back pressure, fool the transmitter into thinking there's more level there than it is, and so it's going to tend to read high. Most of the time, you'll see this one. This is very, very common. Um, if it's a layer of sludge, you got to get rid of the sludge. If it's a plug pipe, you can usually blow it clear. The next more common one would be a leak on the tubing um, or the pipe itself. If you've got corrosion or something at the top of the tank or you have a tubing leak and you're bleeding the pressure off, well, then it's going to read low uh, in this particular case. And probably the least common is going to be a low side tube leak. Uh, where a fitting or something is is not quite tightened up and it tends to bleed pressure. Um, this won't affect you as much, usually only because the level, the pressure in the tank isn't that high anyway, and so a differential is not going to be significant. Um, but these three, particularly the first one, the plug pipe, will cause you grief, and that has nothing to do, like I say, with calibration. All right, boilers. Boilers uh, vex a lot of people. Uh, people are going to radar transmitters, which are better as long as they don't burn up, but um, uh, there are some ones that can handle the higher temperatures, and so people are going there, and they seem to be less problematic, but probably way more common is a differential pressure transmitter like this. Uh, it's hooked up. Um, you're reading the level in the drum. Uh, in this case, the taps are 36 inch apart, and the question I ask is, what is the transmitter calibration? How do you come up with a number? And it's important to understand that because then you start to understand how everything can affect you. So when I look at a calibration, I have to look at the specific water, specific gravity of the water in the drum. I have to look at the specific gravity of the water in the legs that hook up to the transmitter. And then of course I have to tap to tap height. This is a calibration, this is the whole calibration calc. We'll not get into that, but it's important to understand that all of these other things go into the calibration. And so if they're not right, your calibration isn't right. Um, so let's talk about the gravity of the water in the drum. That depends on the pressure in the steam drum. Um, obviously, the higher the pressure, the higher the temperature, the lower the gravity. And so if you calibrated it at, say, 600 pounds, but you're running at 400 pounds, your reading is going to be off significantly. Another one is specific gravity of the water in the legs. So um, in this case, uh, the low leg is counts, it's what matters, and that depends on whether you have a heat trace on or not and what it's set to. So if I'm using a 45-pound steam heat trace, that might be a 293. Maybe I have an electric heat trace and it's keeping it at 100. Whatever it is, you're going to calibrate it on the assumption that you've got a certain heat trace there. And if you turn it off, the reading will drift and change so most people leave their heat trace on year-round to not affect the reading. The, the key point to all of this is that differential pressure calibration depends upon a lot of other things. And the boiler needs to be up to temperature and the heat trace turned on in order for it to read right. And if you're not under those conditions, if you calibrate it or adjust it now, it's not going to read right when you uh, go to normal operating conditions. So you, you need to understand that the Pressure matters, and the heat trace matters. Uh, one other thing that has gotten uh, different people over the years is they look at the sight glass and say, well, that doesn't match the transmitter. And that's possible and even likely, depending on where the transmitter is and where the sight glass is. Uh, the inside of a boiler is a very a violent thing. There's water rolling around all over the place, depending on where the coils are. It is entirely possible, even likely, that one end of the drum will be, have a higher level than the other just because of the massive boiling and, and, and the effects. And so it may not, I mean, it should be close, obviously, as a sight glass, but it may not match it exactly. And so if you're calibrating to the level in the, in the glass, that may or may not be the same as the tank itself. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ned and let him talk some more. All right, Hunter, that was great. I didn't know so many things can uh, cause problems besides the calibrator. So sometimes uh, maybe when I'm talking to a customer, I can point my finger another way. Okay, so here's this uh, BMEX blog again. And, and my next slide was really easy to make because it came right from our blog. 
if again, if what I show you here about RTDs uh, doesn't make sense or whatever, you know, check out our blog and uh, look at the good detail there. Really, uh, I really learned some stuff on this that I didn't know about RTD technology. So, so the basic question is, you know, what's the difference between the two, three, and four wire connection to an RTD? And uh, so if you look at a, a typical meter, you know, it's just measuring resistance. And the way it works is, is it sends out a small, um, typically one milliamp, very accurate current through the resistance of the, of the loop that it's connected to and, and basically measures the voltage drop to calculate the resistance. So it's kind of an indirect measurement, but you know, here's kind of a little schematic. So you can see the, you've got a little current generator and the voltmeter is in parallel. And uh, based on the, the voltage drop sensed here using like one milliamp as a, as a constant current, you can calculate the resistance out there. Well, one problem when you're talking about an RTD, you've got the sensing element out here, but your lead wire is adding resistance to this whole loop. So hopefully you can understand that a, a two wire connection is always going to be off. You're going to have extra resistance based on, uh, on the leads you're using. So typically a, a four wire connection is the best. And why is that? Well, look how the meter is set up. The current is in the outer loop and you, the voltmeter is on the, the internal wires. And what's really cool with this technology is the lead resistance just is, is canceled out. It, there's no compensation or anything. So, so just by connecting in this manner, you get... Uh, you get the true resistance out here on the RTD element. But, you know, it costs, it costs more to build the RTD and they're typically more accurate, so you pay more. So it's very, very common in process industry to use a three wire. And three, there's nothing wrong with three wire. It's very good. The, uh, the key though is your, all three wires that are connecting to the RTD they really need to be identical or an offset can occur. And then I didn't know this. So I got picked this up from the blog. So when you're measuring a three wire circuit, there's internal switching going on. So for a moment, you're measuring just here to get the resistance in this small loop. Then it switches to measure the resistance. Um, oops, I'm on the wrong drawing. So it measures the resistance here, then it measures the resistance here and compensates based for the calculated uh, resistance of the leads. So it's taking R1 and R2, dividing by two, and now it knows what the resistance of the leads are in the circuit. So you can see that there's a basic assumption that the resistance for each leg is the same for the compensation to work properly. And by the way, since, uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a transmitter manufacturer and you're utilizing this switching, there's like some pulsing going on. And uh, I've known that depend certain models of calibrators have problems dealing with the switching circuitry of the transmitter. And this is why. So this, uh, this pulsing that's going on could cause uh, is the reason you're having problems with your calibrator possibly in making a good measurement. So, um, so that's uh, enough on RTDs. So now we're gonna change channels a little bit. We're, we're still talking temperature, but here's a, here's a standard temperature loop. You've got uh, you know, a thermocouple connected to a transmitter and your DCS is taking a reading and, and the transmitter's powered by the DCS card. So uh, we're gonna ask a poll question here. You know, how do you guys, test your loop. So the answer we're looking for is tell us how you do your work out there. So I'm going to turn this over to Katie to throw up. Yeah, no wrong answers on this. Just be transparent. And how would you test the temperature loop? So, yeah. So if you just uh, isolate the transmitter and just calibrate the transmitter, put it back together, that's it. Uh, do you, uh, do you simulate to the DCS? 
uh, and compare the milliamps to the readout, or do you use a dry block bath where you put the pull the temperature probe and put it in the bath? In this case, it was a thermocouple, uh, and then look at the DCS. Or if this doesn't make sense, you can select other. So very interesting. Wow, I wasn't expecting this. So a lot of you guys out there are pulling the the probe and taking the time to put it in a dry block. And uh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, yeah, I got to say, uh, I, I don't know any client that does that. So you guys are you guys are really on your game. <laughs> so we have. <laughs> Yeah, so statistically, I don't know uh, if this represents the whole world, our audience today. But uh, yeah, I think Hunter and I both were expecting more of the pink and less of the purple here. But uh, obviously, uh, this is where the problems occur at the transmitter. But it's also, you know, good to check your DCS card from time to time. Uh, I'll say, too, that the you know, and people don't test it, but the, the thermocouples in particular drift quite a bit. The RTDs are fairly stable. They usually just break, but the thermocouples drift. So uh, checking them if they're, if it's a critical temperature is, is a wise thing to do. Right. And, and, uh, you know, and the temperature element or, or sensor takes a lot of abuse, especially if your process is high temperature. Um, if there's, if it's in a pipe, it's getting, it could be getting physically abused and, and that is going to cause uh, shifts, especially a zero shift. But here's another picture of the loop, the same temperature uh, loop, but we're showing that the actual element, be RTD or thermocouple, connected to a transmitter, you might have a local display or you could have a valve maybe in here. And then uh, what's the readout? Uh, in your in your control system, so doesn't have to necessarily be temperature. It could be pressure. So we could have a pressure transmitter, which is one thing. Uh, or the, although if it's measuring differential pressure, you could have your orifice, uh, you know, the actual flow meter element connected to the transmitter, and then the display. So how do you calibrate this thing? And so what we're, you know, what I'm trying to communicate right here is we want to promote this concept of doing loop testing. And um, so those of you that answered our, our poll, it sounds like a lot of you are doing that, an end-to-end -end loop test where you're putting, in this case, you're able to pull the temperature sensor, put it in a dry block or bath, and compare the reading in the bath to the reading in your control system. And when you do that, who cares what's going on in between? If you're simulating a good 100 degrees here and you're seeing 100.0 over here, you've got a good measurement coming into your system. Uh, sometimes it's not always possible to do an end-to-end -end loop. Sometimes these things are embedded uh, and it's just, you know, if it's, uh, if it's like a capillary pressure, you can't just pull those off and, and make a measurement. So sometimes you, you do have to disconnect the sensing element. And, and But, you know, we still recommend that you do an end-to-end -end or a partial end-to-end -end from the transmitter to the display. When you do a partial loop test, I would encourage you to figure out a way to check the element you disconnected. Um, uh, some a lot of people use like a dual element. So could you check each sensor that's actually in the probe, make sure they're within you know a half a degree or closer, whatever you want it to be, um, or can you install a, a, a parallel thermal well and you you're able to insert a certified probe and you're using your calibrator kind of as a thermometer in the thermal well and comparing that temperature to the uh, installed probe. And again, that's just going to be a one point check, but uh, you know, come up with some ways to check the whole loop if you can. Now, one final point when you do uh, this type of testing, if there is a significant as found error, so let's say it's out like in Roy's test and it, and it showed a failure, so that means you go out, you need to do an adjustment. Then you kind of have to break it down. You can check the transmitter independently, you can shoot milliamps into the DCS, and you can check the element. And 
probably most of the times you've got maybe a sensor problem and just replacing this could improve the loop dramatically. So, um, so then once you have determined the culprit in the loop and made some adjustments, you should do your as left on the loop test to document that you made the improvement. So uh, just as some takeaways here, um, you know, loop testing maybe is not always possible and it may not be the best practice uh, for certain applications, but consider the benefits. So uh, if you're minimizing lifting wires and breaking down wires, you're, you're trying to not disturb your process control. Um, by doing this type of testing, I feel you'll have less arguments within your team. You know, the technician won't be able to point the finger at management and vice versa. I think everybody's going to be on board that this is a, a you know, you're sending a good data to the system. Um, and if you think about it, if there's multiple instruments in the loop, when you do the loop test, it's almost like you're doing two or three things at once. So if you're getting a lot of pass conditions, it's really an effective way to work. Um, and I also feel like doing loop testing, once you've established your procedures, it's pretty simple. When you're moving from loop to loop to loop, the work methods are identical. So uh, people can really uh, get on board with this. And, um, and then if you're documenting your calibrations, you're gonna be able to do uh, um, analysis of your test cycles and maybe find that you're conservative and you're over calibrating and now you can get some gains by extending calibration intervals and, and at least coming up with an optimum schedule. So the bottom line with loop testing is uh, it really delivers the very best measurement to the control system. So who's going to argue with that? Okay, well, it's kind of scary, but it's time for Roy to come back. Yeah, you know, I can hear you. <laughs> Mr. It's kind of scary. <laughs> Roy, what can you share with us about? Uh, you know, I'm going to share something that's probably inappropriate. And Sarah, I want to know if you have yours handy. So Hunter introduced me as like the five-hour energy spokesman. And it's really, it's not that far off. Because let me, if I, some of you probably have never seen one of these before. But this is like an ammo belt. But it's not ammo. It's, um, it's like energy product. And you just, you have this nice belt. Sarah, yeah. So, and there's a. There is another product called Five Hour Safety Lube, and we're trying to market this now or find out if there is a market, but that's what it is. Thank you so much, Sarah. And then if you have this little bandolier holster thing, you can, you know, take one out. I'm not very good at this, but you take one out, you use it, and then you just put it back and you got it right here. But anyway, enough of that. Where am I at? confused <laughs> wait am i confused or are you confused hunter i'm just trying to hang on man keep up we're good yeah you know what you need to hang on for the ride anytime you invite me in here you know that you're you never know what you're gonna get ever <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll second that okay so here's what we have I've got a pressure transmitter here that's set to inches of water. I'm going to calibrate that in a second. But first of all, Ned was talking about RTD wires. And I've got some, I've got an RTD kit that I've had somebody actually make up for me. But you can make these yourself. Let me just take the Velcro off. These happen to be two sets of Pomona leads. And it, it just find a, a good wire manufacturer. I like using these banana plugs because they're the right uh, dimensions for pretty much any calibrator and then I'll I'll take these and I'll just connect them together as long as you have them matched up the same then you have black to black and red to red and I've got my four leads coming out of the other end so this is how we do a four wire setup we stack the two leads over here on the plug and then our two reds will connect to each other and then the two blacks but here's what I did I put on spade lugs and I, I shouldn't have Ned, what's which one should I put on? Yeah, I uh, I I've had customers show me this, and uh, I like just a straight pin, so you can 
you can buy instead of buying a spade lug crimp you can buy a pin type all right so and they'll all four will be the same and yours is really nice with the red and black so yeah that that's really cool what you got there well it's thank great. you so I would agree. I would I would actually cut these off and then re-solder on a pin. I put on spade lugs because it worked on my test unit, but then I hooked up to another brand of transmitter and there was not enough width for these to 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 slip on. So I ended up having to cut off part of this. But this is just a nice way to have a um, a set of RTD measurement leads, and this way you're you're guaranteed that they're all the same. So pressure, I've got a pressure transmitter here and I've got a calibrator. And hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, my calibrator screen, this is not an emulator. You're seeing live what's going on. If I go to documenting calibrator and let me do this first. I've got a pressure transmitter test here and I've got a note for the technician to adjust if greater than 75%. Well, this goes off of what we were talking about before. And you, what you can do is if you know in your mind that, okay, my tolerance is half a percent of span, that's what these, uh, the dark blue lines are. But I've programmed the calibrator to tell me to put in a 75% number, to tell me and show me visually 75% of my tolerance. So if I know that if I'm getting close up there and I'm outside of 75%, why don't we just make it a, a visual thing so you can see what's going on? So that means that if my test point is between those two lines, it's going to pass, but I know I need to adjust it so I don't have to file a deviation and avoid all that paperwork and hassle, et cetera. But this is how you can show it. So back to where I was. On this pressure transmitter, Ned is talking about calibrating a loop. So let's imagine this. I have a pressure transmitter and it's on a, a drum or or a vessel or a pipe. It, does, it doesn't matter. I've got the, the pressure here. I have my transmitter. So then outside of the transmitter, I've got a 4 to 20 milliamp output. But further on down the line, I've got a wire going all the way out to the DCS and a display in the control room. So technically, I could calibrate the start of the pressure transmitter as my primary element. And the final element of my test could be the DCS display. So that's what I'm showing you here. But uh, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to calibrate the pressure transmitter and I'm going to calibrate the whole transmitter to DCS loop all at the same time. I'm doing three test points. And I think, um, let me do this. I bumped my cable. Apologies. He's back. Uh, it's happy. Okay. Don't touch anything, Roy. Nobody move. Okay. I think it was the whole five-hour safety loop thing just affected my calibrator cable. Poor so, bit. yes. Here's my pressure transmitter. I'm going to calibrate this as a loop and calibrate the transmitter all at the same time. What I do is I click on the secret button, create new group. And I'll pick the, the first thing I want to test. And I have two tags here the same. One of them is pressure transmitter and one is DCS display. The first one I want is pressure transmitter. And then I'll say I want to add another thing to the group. And the next thing I want to test is DCS display. Both of these have identical inputs. They're both 0 to 207 inches of water. Here's my second one. Let me go back up to the first. So my first one is the transmitter. And this is 0 to 207 inches in, 4 to 20 milliamps out. And this is the transmitter. If I arrow down to the next device that I'm testing, this is zero to 207 inches of water in, and it's zero to 207 inches of water out. But the key difference here, and no pun intended, will be manually entering whatever the control room says that the display is. So this is the actual loop test. We're introducing pressure to the transmitter, and the final element is what our DCS is saying on the display. And I'll start off, let me just hit, the check mark here. So the first thing I need to make sure that I'm vented. I've got a pressure pump. It is vented here and I'll zero and hit start. There's a five second delay. This is my transmitter test. Once this occurs, now I have my keyed input. So now I just have them radio me what they're showing at the, at the display. And so I'm measuring zero inches in and this blue is what the DCS says. So let me accept this. I'm going to say that that one is also zero. 
My next point on the bottom right, you can see that it wants 103.5 inches of water. So I'm applying pressure. The gray bar represents my target, and that's actually plus or minus 4% of, of the midpoint. It's counting down, and it, it grabbed that. So now I, it's actually 104.49 degrees, and we're extrapolating what the milliamp should be. And what I'm going to say here is that the, the DCS is actually showing 105. So that's what I just got over the radio. We're calculating 104.45 against 105, and it's 0.266% of span error. So I'm going to accept that. Now I'm back to my transmitter. This is an actual pressure in from the pump, and I'm you're seeing a live reading of my milliamp output on that transmitter. Okay, so I'll stop it right there. I'm a little bit above. But so is my milliamps. So we're just doing, this is a linear representation. Actually, this is a square root transmitter. So it is square root. Now, so 210 over here, I'm going to say that this is a little bit above as well. So I'm going to say uh, 210.5. And, and this will be, be whatever is coming back over uh, from the control room on the radio. Now we passed here and the first one up here is our pressure transmitter. How do I know that? It says it right here, pressure transmitter. And I can arrow down and I can look at my graph and then I can look at the numbers. So I have pressure in and how many milliamps out. So I'm getting a live reading here and I'll save this transmitter test. And I've already got another test on here, but I'll save it as found by itself. And now I have the DCS test. So this is the complete loop calibration that we talked about before. If you're going to do one calibration, do this, do the entire loop. But if you still have to calibrate the transmitter, why not just do it at the same time? While we we're generating that same pressure to, for both tests, we can do that at the same time. You can also do this with temperature as well. For example, you can have, uh, if you have an eight channel temperature transmitter, you can put all eight temperature probes into one temperature bath and do it all at once. And we've got a, a video on that as well. So this is the DCS display. Here's the graph showing error. And finally, here is, these are the numbers. So the output happens to be what was keyed in from the DCS. And we were saying that I got those from the, the control room. And we're saving this as found as well. So we have two tests and both of them are complete. And we calibrated two things at the same time it took us to calibrate one. So with that, do we have time for me to show one more thing or do we need to go right into q and A? I know you guys are all just scared of why would you even ask that? We have Please. three minutes left on the official time we gave out for the webinar, so. And we have quite a few questions. Let me show this. On the one, this is a square root transmitter. And I've got it set to linear. So we're talking about things that normally trip you up on, on uh, calibrating. And this is one of the most common with pressure. You've got square root either in the DCS or you have square root in the transmitter itself. As I apply pressure, I'm at 25% on my input, but I'm showing 12 milliamps, which is 50% on my output. This is the number one gotcha as far as with pressure transmitters where you're thinking it's in linear, but it's actually in square root. So 25% on the input gives you 50% on the output. So that's all I wanted to show on this. So Sarah, let's take it away with that second Q&A. Okay, Sarah, thank you, Roy. Gentlemen, if you'll join us. So we have a few minutes here for a few questions and then any we don't address, we will email you afterwards directly responding to your questions. So uh, go ahead and continue to send in your questions because we'll get to you later on, even if we don't get to you here. So the first question I wanna address is from an attendee who works at a medical device company and they contract out the majority of their calibrations to a third party. Um, what are some red flags that they should look for when they receive the calibration results and certificates from the third party. Ooh, pick me, pick me. 
I think the number one thing to look for is perfect numbers. Perfect numbers don't exist in real life as far as if you see your certificate and they're all 100.00, 150.00. That's something to watch out for. Thank you. Okay, does a frequency trim affect the transmitter's accuracy? A frequency trim. <laughs> a trim uh, makes the transmitter change. So it's, yeah. So typically you don't trim unless it's showing that it's off, right? Okay. Do you consider it a it an acceptable practice to adjust a transmitter to compensate for a faulty DCS card or wiring. Uh, this attendee has a customer that's asking them to do this, but they haven't thus far. Um, that's kind of, that is kind of not normal. What, what is typical though, is if you're doing a temperature measurement you cannot adjust an rtd or a thermocouple there is no screwdriver there is no trim commands for the actual sensor so you can essentially decalibrate the transmitter from the true you know signal and in essence you're marrying the field probe to the transmitter. So it's it's like a match set. So you're, you're getting a very accurate four to 20 for a true temperature measurement uh, when you do that type of test. So it's kind of like a loop test, right? Um, so if you're doing loop testing like Roy just demonstrated and what I talked about, may, you, you can, to fix the loop, you either fix the transmitter or fix the DCS input you could adjust those to make it read a true temperature. To me, that's a little lazy. What I would do if I was in your shoes, the person that asked that question is I would say, well, I want to calibrate the transmitter to perfect and the DCS input card to perfect and then do, and then do the as left loop test showing that, that you nailed it. And um, I think the only problem with that is that it depending on the DCS and the age of the DCS, that may not even be possible. So my guess is yeah. that they, I mean, if it was an easy calibration, they would have done it, but they either need to pull the whole board in order to calibrate it or send it back to them and replace it to calibrate it, or they can't calibrate it. And in that case, you're kind of left with no other choice but to fudge it. And, and that's probably what's happening here. And, I mean, there's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as, you, you know, you everybody knows that's what, how you're approaching it. Uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. I agree with Ned. Obviously, if you can calibrate the DCS, do it. But but if if that's not an option, well then you got to do what you got to do. You yeah, I get the reading right. It is common to have an offset. Just be aware of it. I have a we have a customer that does. Uh, uh, he has like six zones that he's measuring with RTDs, and he was having a lot of. Uh, quality issues because he wasn't getting the same. You know, the temperature in one zone wasn't quite the same as the temperature in the other zone. And when he got everything matched up, so he, he was getting, he was doing a loop test, RTD all the way through to the PLC. He had every one, he had six sensors already, no matter where they were, they'd read the exact same temperature. So then in his zone control, he was able to make changes and he improved his quality and throughput. It really made a huge difference uh, by doing essentially six loop tests. So, and it doesn't matter where you trimmed it, if you had to trim it in the PLC side or the transmitter side, or I think in this case, he was trimming the PLC. He was essentially marrying each input of the PLC to the probe that was connected to it. All right, I believe that's all we have time for today. You'll see the emails to each of our presenters here shortly. And so please feel free to email them directly. And if we haven't answered your question, we will do so after the webinar. Katie, what do you have left for us? 
Well, not much. Um, I just want to thank everyone so much for attending and remind you that if we didn't get to your question today, we definitely will. Um, so um, hang tight. One of the presenters will email you with some feedback to your question. Um, please take the survey that appears at the end of the webinar and tell us what you want to see in part two. Um, and our presenter's contact information is listed. We've got Roy, Ned, and Hunter's emails there. If you have a question later on, feel free to contact them. Um, this webinar was recorded, and we will send you a link to the recording um, probably next week. So everyone, um, again, thank you for joining us, and have a great uh, Labor Day weekend. And thanks to all our, our presenters and hosts as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.